hey everyone welcome back to my channel so in this video i'm gonna do step 2 ck questions with you guys for uh, obstetrics and gynecology uh, so let's get started um so first thing we're gonna read the last two lines as usual so examination shows right lower quadrant guarding and rebound tenderness the remainder of the examination shows no abnormalities which to the is the most appropriate next step in management after i read the last two lines i like to read the answer choices so it looks to me here like these are kind of investigations so do we do urine culture or do we give her antibiotics ultrasound ct scan so imaging and lab investigations or laparoscopy it looks to me like this is an emergency situation he's asking you what's your next step and this demographic shows us a young woman now before i read the rest of the vignette guys you need to know that right lower quadrant pain or guarding and tenderness indicative of peritonism in a young woman has so many differentials and the first thing you should rule out regardless of the presentation is whether this woman is pregnant or not so i'm without even read without even reading the whole problem this woman presenting with right lower quadrant guarding and tenderness as per the last two lines and she's young i have to rule out pregnancy so my next step would be to do a beta hcg serum concentration and this is obviously more sensitive and more accurate than a urine test However, I'm still going to read the question. She's presenting to the ER six hours after the onset of colloquial abdominal pain, progressively worsening, associated with nausea and vomiting. This is essentially acute abdominal pain in a young woman. And it has many differentials, as I'm going to show you. She's sexually active, so I need to rule out any pregnancy complications. It could be an ectopic pregnancy. It could be an abortion. And she doesn't use condoms consistently, especially that she has a past history of STD chlamydia before she's feverish which could be PID that's possible right and her vitals are stable so far now I'm gonna show you guys a very nice um, kind of scheme here so this scheme guys shows you what could possibly go wrong uh, like causes of lower abdominal pain in a young woman that has to do with the right lower quadrant or left lower quadrant like this area in particular it may be GI in origin or it may be what part of the reproductive organs if it's GI it could very commonly be appendicitis right especially if it's in the right lower quadrant but it could also be general in origin let's say the tubes PID for example or ruptured ectopic pregnancy the ovaries torsion or ruptured uh, ovarian cyst or hemorrhage right or it could be abortion and its complications PID right peripheral sepsis infection or anything going wrong in the uterus so it could be something wrong in the uterus the tubes or the ovaries right or it could be outside the genital tract and in the appendix or the gastrointestinal tract like diverticulitis and that's why i need to rule out pregnancy first because it could very much well be an ectopic gestation especially in a sexually active woman all right all right guys moving on to the next question this is um a there is no palpable axillary lymphadenopathy. Her physician decides to initiate treatment with appropriate pharmacotherapy. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? Reading the answer choices shows me that they are all investigations, whether imaging, x-ray, or DEXA scan, fundoscopy, or biopsy, or echo. So this is a 53-year-old woman. This demographic is outside reproductive age. So I'm thinking here, other gynecological conditions one month ago she was diagnosed with breast cancer and she underwent a lumpectomy with sentinel lymph node biopsy and he told me in the last two lines that there is no palpable axillary lymphadenopathy now the biopsy showed margin free invasive ductal carcinoma which means that 
it was completely removed with good safety margin surgically and immunohistochemistry revealed that it's ERPR negative meaning I cannot use hormonal therapy rather it is HER2 receptor positive so the natural inclination is that I'm gonna choose a targeted therapy targeting HER2 receptor which is Herceptin right so this is a monoclonal antibody, trastuzumab. Your next step as a physician is to rule out any contraindications to Herceptin. This is essentially what the question wants. So if you remember the adverse effects of trastuzumab and anthracyclines like doxorubicin, danorubicin, is dilated cardiomyopathy and heart failure, in a great proportion of patients so the first thing i would want to do is check her ejection fraction so i would want to do an echocardiography for this patient right now a dexa scan or endometrial biopsy may be used if i'm going to use an er an estrogen antagonist drug but since her cancer is estrogen receptor negative i'm not going to even use that so there is no need to do such tests all right Next question. So this is a sequence of questions solved together. Right. So uh, based on the choices, I can see that we are in an obstetrics question and it's giving me a CTG, right? Like I said, guys, before I answer any question with labs or imaging or any test result I look at it first before reading the question so I'm looking here at a CTG a cardiotocography and the first thing we see in a cardiotocography is the heart rate I can see here that it's within the normal range of 110 to 160 rather the decelerations shown here are abrupt Abrupt decelerations that are unrelated to uterine contractions are variable decelerations indicating umbilical cord compression. All right, as you can see. So if the baby compresses the umbilical cords, there is no blood flow to the baby, resulting in severe drop in the heart rate as the oxygen has been consumed and the myocardium will be suppressed. And this reduction in heart rate or deceleration um, is not related to uterine contractions because the umbilical cord is compressed by something else other than the contractions. And this is unlike other forms of deceleration right so the question is asking which is the most appropriate next step without reading the vignette in a baby who has variable decelerations like this all right and here are the choices cesarean delivery elective or emergency of course i'm not going to do reassurance or repositioning of the mother giving tocolytics what do we do in such a case let's read the question we have a 26 year old primary gravid full term right and her pregnancy complicated with mild oligohydramnios this could possibly cause abnormalities on ctg it could possibly lead to cord compression this is possible right she's 100 percent effaced 10 centimeter dilation ending her first stage of labor now into the second stage she's about to give birth and uh he's engaged right the baby's engaged normal vitals so what do we do now in such a case the first step guys in any case of fetal distress this is considered fetal distress is to reposition the mother and administer oxygen before attempting any other you know more invasive measures or whatever because repositioning the mother means I can essentially keep the umbilical cord away from a site where it could be compressed and giving her oxygen means this oxygen will reach the baby eventually, right? So this is part of a sequence. So after we reposition the mother and 10 minutes later, the same CTG came out, recurrent variable decelerations as well. Of course, because conservative measures have failed, I need to interfere here more 
like uh, more quickly i need emergency condition because 10 minutes um, is too much for a baby to tolerate so the next step obviously would be to uh, do amnio infusion right we need to reduce cord compression by providing a cushion around the umbilical cord uh, because she's already fully dilated i of course cannot do c-section oxytocin it's nonsense this would increase fetal distress by lead more uterine contractions terbutaline is a tocolytic we can't do that and of course we cannot just wait and see monitor without intervention is inappropriate all right so here guys is an example of how oligohydramnios may lead to uh, variable decelerations due to cord compression when we do not have enough amniotic fluid around the baby there is essentially no cushioning between the baby and its parts including the umbilical cord you can see here that the umbilical cord is around looped around the baby's neck and he's compressing it when you do not have enough water to interfere this can cause vessel compression and ischemia with resultant decelerations on CTG right and that's the basis of doing amnio infusion to this mother who has history of oligohydramnios